In this dialogue, I speak with Benita Roy. She's the founder of the Aldalore Insight Center. She's an associate editor for the Integral Review Journal, and she's also the program coordinator for an MA in Consciousness Studies at the Graduate Institute. In our discussion, we speak about the power of writing to reveal hidden dimensions of reality. And we also have an inquiry into agency and the possibility of extending our notions of agency beyond the human sphere. I think you're going to enjoy it. So sitting here thinking about my experience with the book and how much I really thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm uh, expecting that the book will create a lot of generative dialogue and discussion. I mean, there's an infinite number of questions and investigations and explorations that it not only ignited in me, but I can see can be like a foundation for different communities that are interested in carrying their own work forward. So um, thinking about what I what I wanted to really delve into today, I realized that um, I really wanted to get into like the backstory of you writing the book. And I know that in the book you talk a lot about your process and your experience over time. But um, I wanted to ask you about the experience of writing the book and the challenges that it presented presented to you instead of getting into the detail of the book. So, um, right. yeah, so if that's okay. So here, my, sure. like, for example, the book challenges all the way through, you're challenging some basic assumptions about who we are and about our relationship to the world, how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to others. And it kind of offers some, um, uh, like, corrections, let's say, to not only conventional ways of thinking, but, you know, it, it kind of even goes beyond the ways that people are dealing with this material in post-conventional ways. And so I thought I would ask you, like, what are the two or three biggest insights that propelled you and uh, fueled you in writing in writing this book, like just boom. What are mm. what are the three biggest insights? Okay, that's very interesting. Um, I would say that this book emerged out of three different experiences, um, and just interesting that you happen to say three. But I think there's, you know, I've had numerous experiences. I. I've lived a life devoted to spiritual practice and spiritual pursuit and, and have been blessed with many experiences. But there are three that I think this book emerges out of. And the most significant one is the one that's mentioned, not mentioned, but described in the book in the last chapter, which is a, an experience of what you could call collective or intersubjective awakening in which a group of people come together and enter into a shared experience of consciousness in which each individual recognizes that the the source of awareness that is animating them is identical to the source of awareness that animates the others and that there's a mutual real-time recognition and engagement with that fact so uh so i think that's very important that 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 experience is not is not merely a recognition of, of of the unity of consciousness but it's actually a shared recognition in the context of an active engagement with that recognition uh so so that's one and and what that led me to believe what what the insight that that shifted for me is is a great deal of what the book is about because it led me to believe, to realize that the rigid, deeply felt sense of being a separate, isolated individual was simply not accurate to reality. It, it got called into question in that experience. Uh, other experience that that I think feeds into the book are experiences of what are, are maybe more traditionally known as 
awakening experiences in a meditative con- uh, context, which is essentially means the flipping out of the normal constraints of mind into an expanse of consciousness that that feels infinite. And, and in a way, perhaps it's another way to experience the unity of of consciousness. Uh, and and I've had m- numerous experiences, and some particularly dramatic, of that kind of uh, slipping outside of identification with mind. And and I guess the insight that comes from that is you realize that the the ex- the normal experience of mind that we have is not the limit of mind, that there is consciousness far beyond the ways in which we have come to habitually define uh, our minds and our thought processes. Uh, and, and the third experience, which maybe doesn't figure as overtly in the book, but I think underlies the book quite a bit, and, and you picked up on this in some of the things that you wrote to me about, our experiences, and again, numerous and and some and one in particular very dramatic, of what is traditionally called Kundalini awakening or an energetic awakening, uh, and and that means an awakening of an energetic current that flows through the body uh, and and leaves you feeling more energetically physically and and in a sense sensually connected uh with with the world and i think in some of the things that you wrote to me you spoke about uh you mentioned your experience that that in the book there was a a, a certain amount of embodiedness to mm-hmm. the to the writing and to what was being described and i think it comes from that part of my experience which isn't so explicitly discussed. So when you said, what are the three things, those are the three that came to my mind. Cool. You know, so um, I have a a couple of questions that came up for me. Um, This, this, um, so the first thing we talked, you talked about this, this um, intersubjective awakening. And my question, it's kind of an open-ended question is, um, it's, it's kind of, opens up all these new possibilities and it's a little bit of a trick question but you know it seems to me that not only can intersubjective or group process um create these insights faster or you know the question is there's a there's a some sense some sense in which because the structure and the process and the orientation around that there's not just individuals in a room it's that and something else. There's, there's a sense or possibility that it actually will bring us to some place new, or some place mm-hmm. different. Not just it's not just like a speed course in what has been achieved in the past. Can, can you speak to that? Sure. Um, and and I guess you know the, I don't know if we'll have time to go into it completely. Uh, I think the conversation around going someplace new is is a, a tricky one. Um, uh, yeah, I said it was a, kind of a trick question. Yes, I know. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. You, it is a tricky. It's tricky. It's, it's not a trick question. I don't feel trapped, but I'm aware that there's delicacy, and and p- particularly because we live in a very uh, progressive age, new tends tends to be uh, unconsciously assumed to imply better, uh, right? Especially if you're American, because uh, you know we live in a kind of a value system that values new and improved, uh, and and I want to be very careful about those kind of assumptions that that new and better are necessarily equated. Uh, that being said, I th- definitely think there are different possibilities that that you know. I guess I can say it most personally. Uh, all of the various experiences that I've had have led me to the recognition that are that that probably the best way to define human being is not as 
a category of organism or entity, but as a category of possibilities. That you know, when you say well, what is a human being, we normally we normally assume that we mean, you know, what kind of organism is the organism right. that we call a human being, and and I think it, it's more useful when we think of the term human being, not to think of a specific organism or a type of organism, but to think of it in terms of a range of possibilities. You know, And so we might not want to say what is a human being, but we might want to say what is human being? What is the way of being that is currently available to these organisms that we refer to as human? And, and that range of possibilities is created by and also limited by our sense of self. And currently, you know, as I really outline in detail in the book, our sense of self I characterize as a thinking thing. We see ourselves as a thing that thinks, that's separate from other things that think, that we also call human beings, and we have all kinds of possible ways of being that fall inside that experience. And the experiences, the spiritual experiences that I mentioned earlier led me to believe, led me to see, to understand that that, that, is, that experience of being human is just one possibility. The experience of feeling myself to be an organism separate from other organisms, uh, a thing that thinks, is not the only possible experience of being human. And in fact, uh, this collective being that... Uh, that I experienced as an intersubjective awakening brought with it a very different sense of being human. You really felt yourself not as not as rigidly adhered to the organism uh, which you were, you know, which you, you know, obviously were connected to. But you started to feel, oh no, I I am much more than that. And and also all of the the lines of separation that seem to keep you separate from other people and from the world start to call, get called into question and, and you, your sense of self starts to expand and in that expansion you start to see and this gets to your question there's a whole other way to be that can emerge mm-hmm. out of that sense of self and that's really what this book and what all the work I'm engaged in is about which is to help to support as many individuals as possible to expand into a different experience of self and then come together in ways that that would allow the possibilities inherent in that expanded sense of self to become manifest as actual lived experiences between people. You know, one of the things you were t- talking about um stepping out of this identification with mind and um, as a thinking thing, right? Stepping mm-hmm. out of us thinking as a, a little thinking things. And But on the other hand, I think in the book, what's really cool is you've also, um, you know, it, I think there's a lot of approaches and a lot of um, traditions that will try to um, decouple the thinking thing from the lived experience. But in many cases, it's been at the expense of the role of the intellect, let's say, versus the mind. And I think Mm. that what's really cool in this book is that, um, and to use a word that you used in the book and today, it's like you reanimated the role of the intellect, right? So it's not like you just decoupled the thinking thing. It's almost like you reanimated the role of the intellect in these kinds of explorations. And um Yeah, that was really that was really cool. And I think at some point in the book there's that automatically makes me think of some of Aurobindo's um ideas and notions of the intellect and that whole move of moving from thinking thing but integrating and enlightening really the 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 mind to what we might say the level of intellect, I think you really get a taste of that in in your book. Mm. 
Well, I think it's what you're saying is really important and beautiful. Um, and, and it, you know, we live in an interesting cultural time in the West where, um, you know, we're, we're largely uh, in a cultural system that's generally called modernism uh, that emerged through the uh, age of reason or the enlightenment and, and was to a large extent, a reaction against the kind of uh, absolute authority that the church held in, in the medieval world. And, and it, was a, it was a huge embrace of a particular form of mind, we could say. Uh, there, was a, there was a deep embrace of, of an objective view. You know, the idea of science is to step out of a subjective experience, a connected experience with things, to, to observe it objectively in terms of measurements, things that can be verified, so that you, and, and that becomes what the truth is. And, and that has led to, obviously, tremendous advances in the world over the last few hundred years. Uh, nobody wants to go back to the Middle Ages. And at the same time, we also, I think, are becoming more and more aware that 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 way of that form of mind and that way of thinking isn't necessarily capable of embracing the complexities of the world as it is today. Uh, and so, so what I see, and and I'm sure you also see in 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 spiritual circles, is that sometimes a very legitimate movement to to push off of the current form of intellectualization and to create space for other possibilities uh, can, without you know, maybe unknowingly, become an anti-intellectual stand that maybe extends too far, that, that maybe doesn't recognize that, that what it's pushing off of is a particular aspect of mind, a particular form of mind, a particular shape mm -hmm. of thinking. But we don't want to push off of that into no thinking. Uh, we want to create the possibility that a whole other level of wisdom and intellect uh, can emerge that, that maybe right now we can't recognize. I, I sometimes like to think of it as the new thinking. Uh, and, I, and I believe that one way that you and I both characterize the kind of thinking that we need to question is a dualistic thinking that sees in terms of creating distinctions and divisions. Mm -hmm. And we need to embrace uh, something that's more like a non-dual or unifying thinking that uh, progresses by seeing relationships and greater wholes. Mm -hmm. You know, I just came back from teaching uh, a three-day teaching and, I, and it's an introductory course and so I always well it's the first first class in the course and and I always like to um, talk about the move from a, basically a structural or a mechanistic a reductionist paradigm to a um, process paradigm and I, I know you're uh, seem to be a natural process thinker and I always use this example of um, if a structuralist and a process philosopher are sitting in the room and you ask them to imagine uh, three glasses of water, right? the, the, they both can agree that the water is the process and the glass is the structure. But the structuralist is seeing three glasses of water on the table and the process philosopher is seeing three glasses emerged or submerged in a tub of water. And mm -hmm. we talk about how um, if you're fundamentally from the first camp where you see three glasses of water on the table, well, there's certain kinds of problems arise that your scientific investigation has to answer. Like you can see that there's individuality, but you have to then explain how can these how can things touch right? right you can see the history of western philosophy and science continually trying to answer this question is 
how do events touch each other? How does cause and effect happen? And the reason why they have so much of a problem because they start off fundamentally from an orientation where these things don't touch. Whereas in a process philosophy, and I think this is more like the orientation that you're coming from, you have three glasses in submerged in a tub of water. So it's easy to see how there's a sense of boundary in individuality, but you, it's easy to see that in a, you don't have to come up with a third term to see how things touch. And mm. this switch in itself, I think, um, is, an, is an, an analogy or a nice heuristic to see, you know, so you're sitting in group process and you see you see this, the process version and it's very clear that that's what's informing these new you know, conceptions and, and, and experiences, not conceptions. I mean, it's the whole way of being in relationship changes if, when that shift is starting to happen. So that's, that's really, that's very, it's very powerful and it's very important. And it's very central to the, to the book because as you, as you're saying, if there's an underlying assumption of separation, that somehow separation is the way the world is. It creates certain problems. And and historically, I guess that's been the case or really got accented when Descartes made a very strong division between mind and body as mm -hmm. two separate realms of being. And the problem that immediately arises is, well, that when I think about picking up this book, how does the thought, which is one realm of being, affect the body which is another realm of being and result in the book actually getting picked up and Descartes didn't know how to answer that question he knew it was tricky I believe that in the end he made a gesture that it probably happened in the pituitary gland which was just a gland they didn't really know what it did right uh, but it was sort of left as a problem to be solved later and we're still working it out uh, and, a, and, an, and another example of that is something that really influenced me a lot was William's, William James's ideas about time uh, because he said, well, we, we're taught to think that time happens in moments, separate mm -hmm. instances. But if, if, if it does, then how does information from one moment get into the next? And, if it, it, and since obviously information does get in, in from one moment, gets into the next, it either has to happen through some, as you said, third medium, like some transcendent space that it can travel through to get into the next moment, you know, or he's, you know, which he didn't want to accept. So he said the only other option is that actually moments are not discrete. They don't have distinct beginning and ends. He's, mm -hmm. He believed that moments are more like sound waves, you know, that, mm -hmm. that what we're experiencing right now as the present moment is the peak of a wave, but that this, the wave of this moment extends all the way back to the beginning of time and all the way forward uh, to the end of time. It just Its intensity and its influence diminishes as it goes back and it diminishes as it goes forward. Uh, mm -hmm. And that really blew my mind because it meant that, that this, you know, it, may, it helps me understand eternity because this moment includes all moments all exactly. past and all future moments yeah i like to ask people this is kind of a cool question and i like to ask people is the first amoeba still alive mm -hmm. right right. right and it and yeah so there's something and and i think that's you know what's really cool about your book because it's working in a very playful uh, relatively accessible, you know, some of these things, if you don't, haven't ever gotten the hang, once you get the hang of it, um, but it plays with what I call metaphysical primes, like these very, very fundamental assumptions that come from our culture, but the dominant culture is almost, is a, um, these dominant assumptions are almost worldwide, so it's very hard to get outside of them, you know, um, and even if we read, like, early Chan Buddhism or something, it's always in translation, and the translation tends to be more in this direction. So I think that 
um, yeah, that's why I said it's kind of like a radical new American Enlightenment because it's not just working with what we have, but it's switching some of these under very, very foundational assumptions and showing that once you make these switches, a whole new science and a whole new spirituality and a whole new way of uh, intersubjective um, experience kind of cascades outside of these mm. uh, major insights. You know, once you have a major insight, then everything else can get restructured in a, in a different way. That's, that's I, right. You know, I, see, that's why I started off by saying, I mean, there's there's so many conversations that can be ignited um, mm. by, the, what, by what you've uh, written in this book. So um, and then can, I, can we go on to your third insight? But so sure, please I don't want to do. lose your first three things. Yes, go for it. Um, which is about Kundalini um, and the embodied aspect, and and um, of that these things aren't just um, the rational mind trying to do metaphysics, or not even just a meditative contemplation that some people might think is more. Um, have to do with your cognitive capacity, but there's an, an embodied shift. Actual, it's a lot to do with kundalini energy or the physical embodied experience that is shifting. And you had said um, before that one of the mistakes people make is they mistake the certain kind of mind as, quote-unquote, the mind is problematic. And, mm-hmm. in fact... The, the mind can move to a different type of mind. This, this, what we, what I was calling uh, intellect. But in terms of embodied experience, isn't it the same? Like there are some practices that, um, in a lot of Western um, approaches to, let's say, cognitive psychology or something, they do the same thing. They say, well, emotions are a problem. You know, so because some kinds of embodied experience or emotions are problematic, they seem to mistake that for, um, you know, they they seem to to overlook the possibility or the the emergent capacities of the let's say the affect streams or the body itself. So, is there something similar? I mean, to that in your experience. In terms of embodiment, um, yeah, I think the whole, you know, and, and this is, as I said, it's it, it comes through in the book, and I'm really happy that you experienced it, and I, I was hoping it would come through, but I think it's also something I'm exploring even more since writing the book, and will probably be included more prominently in future books. Uh, but I think the whole distinction between mind and body. Uh, really needs to be questioned uh and and as you were saying earlier you know, i know i feel like this book is an invitation to inquiry uh mm-hmm. and in that sense i put it firmly in the tradition of american philosophy uh because the the great the, the greatest contribution american contribution to philosophy is pragmatism which i speak about in the book and pragmatism is not a set of ideas it's not a set of beliefs about the world. It's a method of inquiry. It's a way of of investigating. Uh, and and if we go earlier than pragmatism, the transcendentalists also, although they had ideas about reality, at least from what I'm from what I've read, there's this great quote that says the thing about transcendentalists is that they are they're a group of the like-minded because no two of them think alike. Uh, <laughs> and and so, really, this country has a tradition, a philosophical tradition that's very focused on inquiry. And so, an inquiry needs to happen in relationship to mind and body. And, you know, it's a, fundamentally the inquiry of this book is an inquiry into the assumption of separation. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we hear people talk about is, they make a distinction between mind and body and then feel that, well, as you were saying earlier, there's, there, 
they imagine that there is some kind of a meditative contemplation or intellectual contemplation that is somehow happening outside of the body. But if you think about it, there is no consciousness outside of the body. Uh, we are embodied beings, and and the shape of our consciousness is dramatically influenced by our embodied experience. Uh, the way that we perceive is limited by our bodily senses. And, you know, everything that we can know in the abstract, you know, essentially relates to some some collection of bodily mm. experiences. You know, you, you can't have a disembodied mind. I know I mentioned in the book uh, a, an, an author named Alvin No, who speaks about this very beautifully in, in his writing about the fallacy of imagining that you can have a disembodied mind, that, mm -hmm. that you could have a brain in a vat, as the classic thought experiment goes, that would develop anything like consciousness that we know. Yeah. In order for con the consciousness as we know it to be developed, it needs to be developed in an organism that has a body, something like ours, that interacts with the world, something like the way that we do, because it's in that interaction and that interplay with the world and with each other that the capacities for mind that we experience are generated. So there is no separation between them. The, the separation is artificial and and it's created later. Uh, but in fact, mind and body emerge as one event, uh, always. And, and so that's why I'm getting so excited about exploring the, the nature of embodiment and the influence of embodiment uh, on, on the entire experience of being human. Yeah, and it's it's really a challenge and kind of a drag that even our language of it, we constantly have to say mind and body are one. And, and so what's the word, right? What's right. the word that just stands in for that instead of the language always separating it and then the the sentence, you need a whole sentence to put them, put them back right. together and... And, and that's what the the challenge of writing a book like this is that you know I'm endeavoring to express to the extent that that I can a different paradigm and yet the only tool I have for expression is a language built in the current paradigm. Correct. Uh, so the language that we have is is perfectly designed to express things in the existing paradigm but incredibly inefficient to express things in the new paradigm, which is why in in the writing of the book, what I naturally want to use all the time are metaphors and stories uh, and things that are, that are more poetic, that allow, allow for more ambiguity of meaning uh, so, that, so that the words can gesture you toward an experience that you might slip into and have, uh, but that ex that experience, that that different way of being, that new paradigm, can't be held in the words per se. It can only right. be provoked by the words. So I had written this to you, and you know, you know, I immediately acknowledged that in this book there is a narrative tone or narrative voice as you just started describing or an approach or an orientation that is um not only unique but um it was required to develop a a kind of narrative voice that could capture some of these you know that that could face these difficulties and still deliver the message, let's say. And so I was wondering if this was something that, a book that you wrote over and over and over, and then somehow, I was just wondering, like, did you just have a felt sense already that it should be poetic, and these questions, the, this wonderful phrase you have of gesturing, the language should gesture. Did you have that felt sense at first, or did you 
go through a long process of trial and error to get through your voice. I know you always in your previous books you you had the wonderful personal um, way of being able to re- relate your personal experience, but was, it was this other thing that tricky thing that you managed to do in this book was to weave that with this um, new way to use language to mm. as pointing out instructions almost for both spiritual experiences and some of these new paradigm things like what, what how was was that did the whole shift in that in the insights you have enable that voice to come out or was that something that you kind of had to work at in a in a longer kind of way mm. well to be honest this book more or less emerged as it is um, yeah you know the the what what happened at first was uh, I had, you know, I've, I, many years ago, devoted my life to spiritual pursuits, and I spent a long time living in uh, a, a spiritual community that was very experimental, and and where I had tremendous freedom to do practice and to pursue awakening to my heart's content, and had the luxury of numerous experiences of all kinds, and then that community came to an end, and. And I felt this desire to sort of harvest what had come out of that experience, and and it happened very spontaneously. One, I actually happened to be on a, on a retreat in which part of the retreat was spontaneous writing, and I just started to spontaneously write, and I wrote, and 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 the energy for that that writing was so you know that was almost a kundalini experience the the energy to write you know, sort of overtook me every day so every morning i would write for a few hours and in a fairly short amount of time i had written 200 pages the first 100 pages of that i published as a book called radical inclusivity and and i knew that around page 100 a second book had started and that I had a hundred pages written, uh, and those hundred pages are still in this book. And I went back and went through the book again, and and I think that may be where the weaving came in because the original writing was more narrative, mm-hmm. or uh, <clears throat> and then I went back and I backfilled with some of the philosophy and the history. Uh, but it wasn't done in a kind of it was also done in a stream of consciousness way. All I did when I went back was I just uh, started at some point in the writing and I sort of just started editing what I had already written and then at certain points, I would find myself just moving out into a tangent that seemed to want to be in that. I mean, I actually feel in a certain way. It was almost like the book wrote itself, and I was listening for what wanted to be in the various places. Uh, and and so I'd be, you know, doing some more normal editing for just uh, consistency and, and grammar. And then all of a sudden I'd find myself, you know, it was literally like I would be doing more normal editing, and then all of a sudden I'd realize it was, you know, an hour and a half later, and I had just written 20 pages yeah. that needed to go in exactly that spot. Uh, and and so it wasn't like something I thought through or organized or labored over for a voice. It really was a much more of a kind of spontaneous event. Yeah, you know, I really enjoyed it, and it's it's a perfect length. It's For me, I just felt that it was and and looking back on it now i just realized that um you know it's not unusual for someone to have a narrative tone and it's not unusual for someone to um share with readers their own inquiry you know so we get we can hear the philosopher's mind some of the great philosophers you actually the book is a portal to to 
hear how they think, right? But I realized that your whole book is so present to not only your lived experience, but to the reader themselves. This was also mm-hmm. interesting to me, that there was, you know, it's not like you were talking to the reader and then you segued into it language, blah, 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 you know, Dewey says this and me like this. Even when you're describing the work, the intellectual or work, of the American pragmatists, it's still in, you're still in relationship to the reader, you know, you the mm. reader, and not like through these kind of rhetorical uh, ruses that some of these, um, you know, early English novels had. You the reader will notice, not not like that. It's just constantly uh, felt that, I had constantly had the experience that you were attentive, that there was someone on the other side of the, other words, and I didn't know if that was something you worked more into afterwards, or I, I'm guessing it's because you're so um, actually embodied into this shared reality, and people, the other is so present to you. I mean, I would I would guess that that's really why, the, how, and why that unique voice is present in your book. Well, that's that's very interesting because I I do I know when I write and when I wrote this book uh, I I very much feel I don't feel an abstract audience I feel like I am feeling the I am feeling a person or the people reading the book while I write it uh, mm-hmm. you know because this moment contains all moments. The people who will read this book in the future are reading it now. That that, mm-hmm. and I I feel like I am with I am present with the reader while I'm writing. And and I think you're you're right because because the nature of my experiences have been so relational. And and because one of the flips in my own experience it has made is is kind of really helps me take my attention off of, to some extent at least, off of the things in the world and, and be able to place it more squarely on the relationship that constantly exists that I think that tone comes from. And then it, just as you were saying that, I realized I don't know which proof edition you, you received, but in the book, in the acknowledgments, I have an acknowledgment to the baristas at a local coffee shop that's around the block <laughs> from my house because almost the entire book was written in the coffee shop. Uh, so it was written with people all around me. Uh, and I was very aware of the people. And sometimes in the book I refer to, you know, I use people in the coffee shop as uh, as sort of props for inquiry. Yeah. Uh, so it was on many levels, uh, imbued with embodied relationship. Yeah. Um, So, moving a little bit off from your book, I know that you mention it very briefly, and it certainly uh, piqued my interest because it's it's something that I'm very um, kind of focused on. And that is, um, if we think about, you know, moving away from thing thinking, not only a thinking thing, but thinking in terms of thing, and we Mm -hmm. move away from thinking in terms of separation, and we move toward being and thinking in terms of relationship and this notion of reanimation, my question for you is how far beyond the human realm does this paradigm move? And, um, you know, is it, is, it, is it applicable to non-human um, beings? Is it applicable even beyond there? What, and, and, you know, I know this is, this is more of kind of moving into maybe hypothetical or speculative, but, you know, uh, thought maybe we could impro- improvise mm. off that question. Absolutely. And, and you know, this really does relate to 
things in the book, particularly the second chapter, um, which I believe is called uh, On Being a Being. And, and what I say in that chapter is that I believe the most important philosophical question of our time is uh, what how far are we can we extend the term being uh, because you know we have there are things and there are beings and things are uh, objects that can be subjected to the will of beings and beings are entities that have that that are deserving of care and concern and and my feeling is that we need to extend the concept of being far beyond what we currently do. You know, we've we've done a pretty good job over the last few hundred years extending that throughout the human species, but but even there we still have some mm-hmm. we ha- we have work yet to do. It's you know, things are better but not not complete. Uh, We certainly need to extend it throughout the animal kingdom. And, you know, ultimately to the world as a whole, that that a lot of our ecological challenges come because we treat, we don't recognize the world as a being, as a, as a living entity. We, we treat it like a thing a thing made up of other things, some of which are useful to us, which we feel we have the right to extract. Uh, mm-hmm. And and so, yes, this concept of being needs to expand, extend far beyond our current notions of of being human. And that's that's part of what I find so so exciting. And I don't know how much you are are you know of the a group of philosophers who call themselves. Uh, who identify as speculative realists, uh, but they, I, it's a group that I'm, I'm very fond of, at least some of the members of, and some of them subscribe to something called an object-oriented ontology. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they really, in different ways, uh, want to, I mean, one, of the, one of the agendas that they have is to, extend beingness to uh to to things that we currently tend to relate to as objects so in in a retreat i did a seven day a five day retreat last summer and uh i started to play with you know some of the kinds of inquiries that are in the book are also the kinds of things i would do on a retreat uh so i asked people during a certain for a certain amount of time like for an afternoon to notice that we habitually, like for instance, I'm I'm now picking up a glass. I habitually relate to that as me, a thinking thing, making an autonomous decision to pick up a glass, moving my hand and then picking up the glass. And and I said, play around this afternoon with having the same exact thing happen, but consciously define it as the glass wanted to be picked up, called out to you. Mm-hmm. And you responded, and see if you can start to animate the world. And what you realize is, wow, my experience that I'm the living thing, and all these other things are just objects, is not necessarily the only way to experience the world. And we can maybe be much more creative with how we experience reality than than what we imagine. Yeah, so this is like where I get really excited and hopefully I know we talked about maybe doing some other types of interviews because for me, I know a lot of, you know, just different interpretations, but I know a lot of um, people or traditions and philosophies will say that the primary separation comes from our fear of death. But I really right. think that our fear of death comes from the primary separation of things that are animated and what we think are not animated or things that are beings and things that are not being. Because mm-hmm. if we didn't make that separation, we would there wouldn't be this this gap between life and death, right? So so I, I think I actually see it as more fundamental. Um, 
And the reason why it's overlooked by most other people is because the people that put it into the question of death have already implicitly made this irrecoverable separation between mm. what is animate and what is non-animate. And like I've had a lot of experiences as, as you have in 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 different ways, but you know a lot of these insights come to you not as thought experiments, but actually rearranging your whole way of being in the world. And for example, I remember um, driving. I was driving down. You know, I have horses, and I was driving down to this farm where I used to keep them. They're currently with me now, but it, the, the farm had these long rolling hills, and it was one of those beautiful days in the spring where the sun is like low in the sky, and the horses were grazing. And all of a sudden, just, just you know, looking at them, I've seen them a hundred times, but it seemed I couldn't tell if the horses were eating the grass or if the earth was making horses, you know, right. like. If the earth was made, it really, that that structure that makes it one way was gone. And I started, and then one day I was watching this Discovery Channel um, uh, series of uh, CDs called Planet Earth. And it was really beautiful photo, you know, video. And they were talking about, they were showing how when the Serengeti planes flood but they showed it from a satellite view and you could and you know a time lapse photography so you could see the Serengeti plains flooding and then you could see the my huge migratory um animals coming right and the narrative over it was all about the all the and you know the the animals moving toward the water and all I could see was the power of the water to move all that biomass to it you know Mm-hmm. And I started having these experiences of, and I started to think of how coffee, coffee moves people every morning, right? I mean, millions of people, it has, it has caused wars and changed national boundaries, right? And you start to see this reanimation, and it's only because, you know, we like to think of, we, we're not only, you know, we're not only cultural centric and egocentric we're so anthropocentric and masters of the universe and so this creates like a whole new inquiry and i and i really believe it's the paradigm shift the only paradigm shift that can solve an ecological problem Mm. and 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 yeah so now i'm getting all jazzed up but it's it's i really liked that that was certainly a node in your book and um it's it's a it's for me a galling absence in almost all our modern spiritual communities. The discourse might be around we need to be stewards of the earth the dis but but what is not in these communities is an embodied you know experience shift in the relationship of humans to the rest. <laughs> That's, There's that no is so beautiful. pointing out instructions. There's no, um, yeah. So that I, that, you know, that just is what I'm into. But I see that I always see your work and my work as, um, you know, we're the product of what is emerging. We're not the, the, you know, pioneers. Right. And we're not pulling it into existence. It's, you so. may remember that there's this there's a part in the book. I mean, I'm very jazzed. I'm I'm very jazzed up about everything you're saying. So, we share that for sure. There's a part in the book where uh, <clears throat> there's a great example of music. Uh, yes. And, you know, we we because we've assigned agency to the human, and so we see everything through our presumption of agency. So we think we made the music, and David. Uh, Burn of the Talking Heads writes very eloquently that, you know, it may be more accurate to say circumstances create music because mm-hmm. in the Middle Ages they had cathedrals and so a certain kind of music was born there. That wasn't mm-hmm. just an agentic choice of the humans. That was, it happened in relationship. So, so what I'm jazzed about, which I know you are as well, is that 
is to recognize that everything is always happening in relationship. And right. we aren't just, we aren't the only agentic part of the relationship. Right. Uh, you know, agency needs to be dispersed throughout the world. You know, it's sometimes I talk about it as like a, a new animism. Yes. Uh, Neo, you know, we yes. don't necessarily want to go back to Aristotle thinking that the rock is falling because it's getting happier because it's getting close to its mother. Correct. You know, at the same time, there is an animism, a reanimation of of the world that we have labeled as dead that needs to be brought back to life. I need to see this book wants to be read. Right. Uh, and, and it doesn't just want to be read because some human being wanted me to read it. It, it itself wants to be read. And right. I know that sounds bizarre, but I really feel it's crucial that we reanimate the world and we we start to at least experiment with agency and and certain animal uh, characteristics. At least try it on to see how to see if we get a better result. And I guess that's the pragmatic part of me, you know. Let's, yeah, yeah. Let's reanimate the world and see if things get better. And what's happening, actually, is the deanimation of everything is actually becoming, the human being is becoming deanimated, too. So right. this is why we think machines are, at, are smart, as smart as people, because we've reduced people to that part that can be deanimated. I mean, I truly believe that machines, it's not so much machines have been getting smarter, I believe that our culture is becoming so standardized and deanimated that we can see the gap is small. I, I you know, I just mm. the beginning because so so that's that's a real threat. You know, I wrote an article that said you know c- climate change is is dangerous not because the Earth is getting more unpredictable is because people are getting so much more predictable. And so I think we're deanimating ourselves, even as we, we we retain and increase our sense of agency and masters of the universe, right? Because that's an illusion anyways. So it can remain an illusion as well, right down to the fact that our our brains are downloaded into a computer and yeah. that's how deanimated we'll get and still think that we're masters, you know? So I think there's, there's that side that kind of instrumentalizing the the need there but um yeah i think it's a big important topic and i and and the thing is and i could hear it in your voice when when you reanimate the world you know not intellectually but when that happens it's just an incredible gift i mean you're walking in you know something that looks like um what was that great movie that was beautiful and the um um those beings that connected with an intelligence by putting their tails into the earth. Oh right, Avatar. Avatar. I mean when you reanimate the world and you allow that shift to happen, you walk through the world and it you experience it like that. This really has been completely delightful. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you know, I, I like you, I feel so much resonance with with your work and with your way of thinking. Uh, and it means a lot to me that we were able to have this conversation. And I, I really look forward to it being a jumping off point to uh, future possibilities. <laughs>